Good morning. <laughs> I want to welcome everybody to worship today on this uh, first Sunday after Pentecost. Um, I think I've got everything put together. I always like to give the impression that I have a million things to do because then you'll readily believe that I remembered 999,995 of them. <laughs> that always works well. Okay. Um, today is Peace with Justice Sunday. We're going to have a special uh, conference offering. And later, before the offering, I'm hopefully, if I've remembered correctly, we'll share a video with, video with you from annual conference about the Methodist Mission Center in Abilene. That was, um, I'll tell you more about that at the appropriate time. Also, today at 11.45 a.m., the church council will meet in the seekers class and fellowship hall uh, pretty much immediately after worship. Uh, Wednesday, June 14th is, is Flag Day. Um, for those who, uh, do you do, I don't know what you do on Flag Day other than put out a flag, but we're gonna have Bible Fellowship also this week, continuing through the book of Exodus. And Saturday, this coming Saturday, June 17th, we're having Frankie Valance here on, uh, in concert. He's going to play for some music for us, including some of his uh, familiar classics, like The Lion Sleeps Tonight and This Magic Moment. He's also going to share with us his testimony, his story, and hopefully some gospel tunes. And that's going to be at 6 p.m., and it's going to be followed by uh, snacks and fellowship across the way. The snacks will be up to us. Uh, anyone who wants to bring a snack, uh, cookies, a cake, that would be very much appreciated to, so that we can offer hospitality to as many who uh, show up and want a time of refreshment after the concert. Sunday, June 18th, yep, Father's Day. I like the row of ties in case you were forgetting what you need to get, Dad. Get him another tie. Uh, even though we don't wear ties a lot in this part of the country, am I the only one wearing one today? Eh, get him a tie anyway. <laughs> Tuesday, June 27th, uh, 8.30 a.m., the UMW is having their uh, breakfast and an annual conference report. All women are invited, and that is going to be taking place at the Roost, so please RSVP to Hazel so she can uh, let Christy know ballpark figures about how much food to have ready for everybody. A little further down the road, Sunday, July 2nd, we are going to have a picnic in the park. Um, this is the one with the gazebo on Railroad Avenue. I'm trying to correct myself. Every time somebody tells me the name of something and says, oh, it's that one, I say, great. I still don't know where that is. Um, it, no, well, I mean, it's at least common knowledge. It's not like you know where the old oak stump was before they dynamited it 10 years ago. It's, <laughs> so it's reasonable. And we are, after morning worship service, we're going to uh, gather in that park for hamburger and picnic and also hopefully uh, invite members of the community to share that time with us. And I'm going to give you a heads up on that Sunday, uh, dress for the park. And uh, I intend to lead by example. So not church clothes. If you want to wear church clothes and you just can't be caught dead in the park or the sun, I understand. But just to give you fair warning, I won't, I'm not going to be wearing uh, this. I have no intention of going to the, the park and getting grass stains on my Sunday clothes. I was raised to have Sunday clothes, so I've still got them in the closet, and I enjoy using them. But on that day, we're going to dress for the park. Again, I welcome you all to worship. Yeah. Oh, wait. No way. I was warned. I t thank you for listening. She said, could I have a moment for announcements? And I said, well, yeah, but you better take it. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> take it. Some of y'all will not be at the women's deal. I'm going to give you a little preview because I know the guys want to report, too about annual conference and the theme of the conference was sent. We are sent to tell the world about God's love. Jesus told us in Matthew 19, 28, 19, and Lee's gonna read all the rest of it, but therefore go and make disciples of all nations. We are sent out to make be disciples. But how do we do that? We gotta invite people. The easiest way to invite people, we were told is three words, come and see. Um, Jesus called Philip to follow him. He said, Philip found Philip, said, follow me. But Jesus, first thing Philip did was go to his buddy Nathaniel, sitting under a tree. 
And Philip said, we found him. We found the one the prophets have told us about. And Nathanael's going, yeah, right, it's a guy from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And what did Philip say? Come and see. So, but what do we have for them to see? We have us. We have all the stories of how God has worked in our lives, how he has changed our life, how he's loved us. And when people come to see Jesus, or when people, people came to see Jesus, what did he do? He told stories. He told parables. He told about the prodigal son. He talked about the widow's lost coin. He talked about the lost sheep. He had so many parables, the mustard seed, so many of them to tell the stories that he was trying to get them to learn. And we have stories. A lot of people will say, oh, I'm too old to do that, or I'm too young to do that, or I don't know enough to do that. But everybody in this building has a story. And I have a story. And one of my stories is I love to sing. Y'all know that. And I love to sing about God's love. And one of the songs we're singing today by God's plan, I believe, is How Great Thou Art. One of my very favorite hymns ever. It has so much meaning to me personally, family stories. But the words in it, when we sing it, listen to the words. It's got such a magnificent message. And I love those songs that tell about God and his majesty and his love. But how do we know that that's going to work? I mean, yeah, I know, I've know i got stories, things that have happened to me and people I know and different things. But how do we know it's going to work? we got to have faith. And faith like the centurion that came to Jesus and said, my servant is sick, he's sick, and he's paralyzed, and he's suffering. Come here. He, and he asked Jesus to heal his servant. So Jesus said, okay, let's go. And the servant centurion said, no, no, no. I'm not even, I don't even deserve to have you in my house. But I understand authority. I, I have authority. When I tell my, my servants and my men to jump, they say, how high? I say, go over there, they go. I say, come here, they come. You have authority to heal this man, to heal my servant. And if you say the word, he will be healed. And Jesus was amazed. This is a Roman centurion, the complete opposite of a Jew that's been raised in the, in the faith. And Jesus was amazed and said, told the centurion, go and let it be as you have believed it was, it would be. And that's when the servant was healed. So if we know that God is going to work in the lives of the people we love, if we have that faith like that, because God said it would happen, then it'll happen. So we need to have that faith. Do we, do we have doubts in our ministries? We do sometimes. We need to not, we, but we need to know that God will make anything possible. So when we go out of this building, we need to know that everybody we meet, we can touch their lives. We can say, come see, come to church with us on Sunday. Come see us. We tell them the, sto the stories that you have. Robert knows stories about prison life which sounds bad when you say that out loud, but he knows <laughs> what he, he, he knows that how God has worked in prison. We've all been involved in Operation Christmas Child. We know how that affects the children that we send boxes to. We all have a story. So go out and tell the story that you have and tell your friends to come and see. And that's, that's what annual conference was about. Well, let's get on with it and see what there is to see. Please prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude together.
Now let's sing one of those good hymns. Um, let's sing All Things Bright and Beautiful. We'll sing all four verses. If you'll stand with me, please. <laughs> to worship this morning is Psalm 8 with a sung response, the sung response number one. You can find that on page 743 of the uh, Red Hymnal. Sing praise to God who reigns above the God of Lord, our Lord, your glory is chanted above the heavens by the mouth of babes and infants. at your heavens, the work of your fingers. The moon and the stars which you have What are human beings that you are mindful of them? And the worlds that you care for them. Yet you have made them little less than God. And crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have you put, put all, all things, things under their feet. feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord. 
How majestic is your name in all the earth. to our time of prayer, I ask, are there any joys or concerns that uh, 
you'd like to share? Big Joy that lays back and we're glad she's out of the yeah. Good to see you there again. Even if we do have to drag a mic over there so you can read the scripture. Mm, okay. Uh, joy that you're our pastor for another year. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't spring one on me. I, I can't imagine the days when they would just show up. And they didn't find out until conference if they were going to be moving. And... You know, whenever that was. So I would have come back yesterday and said, well, we've got 12 days. <laughs> we're gone. Ooh. <laughs> Other joys or concerns today? We had a great time in conference. I mean, I got a little taste of it. It was a great worship time. And what little business we had to take care of was really well. Any other joys or concerns? Well, it's great to see you here, Rose. And you, sir? Yes. <laughs> Welcome. We, we, you know, we went over that at annual conference. That was one of the things that Andrew talked about, mm -hmm. and we were just talking about it across the way, is that we just go through this, this rhythm routine where everybody's familiar with what we're doing, and, and we know what we're doing. We don't explain it. We, there's nothing in the language of the service that suggests that, hey, if you don't, you're not usually here or you're new here, that we actually are glad you are here. We don't do it on purpose, but by assuming that everybody knows exactly what's going on, we kind of create the impression that, hey, this is for people who know what's going on. And, you know, we say welcome with one hand and then kind of show you the back of the other. So we're going we're gonna to work on that. Okay, any other joys or concerns this morning? We had rain. We did have rain. I saw it. I, we got some in Lubbock, too. And the house I was staying in was still standing afterwards, so that's a joy, too. All right, then, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, to you who created all hearts, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, through the inspiration of your spirit, that we might perfectly love and worthily magnify your holy name and give us the wisdom to pray. We thank you, Lord, for Lee, that she is back with us. We ask that you continue to strengthen her body. We're thankful for her heart of service. And I'm thankful that I am here again in this church this year to serve with these people another year. It's taken me almost this long to appreciate just how much treasure is tucked away in all the corners and the nooks and crannies of this congregation in this town. Uh, we pray that uh, soon and very soon you will pour out your spirit and reveal your glory and goodness to us and to many here in the town of Shamrock. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for your care for the earth and for us. And we do thank you uh, for all who are here today, and especially our visitors or occasional attenders. We ask that you would uh, help us to extend your welcome. That's why we are here today, and it's why I'm here today, because in a world that was everywhere rejecting me, I saw your open arms, and I felt your heart of welcome, and I came, and I saw. You've led us apart from the busy world into the quiet of your house, where we're welcomed. Please grant us the grace to worship you in spirit and in truth, to the comfort of our souls and the strengthening of every good purpose and holy desire. Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us so that we can worship you not just with our lips at this hour, but with all our words and all our works all the days of our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray together as your children, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I am indeed glad to be back, and I appreciate my little caretakers here. Um, uh, running out of breath is not a fun thing to do. I kind of figured that when I couldn't talk at all because of the sickness that I had, that maybe it was a message from the Lord. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, I saw I was quiet for, for quite a while there, but I really miss being here. Tell you what, I was just sitting back there going, oh, this feels like home, and it does. And uh, Jared is welcoming us back with a first chapter of Genesis and the second chapter, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and separated the waters, which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it all was good. And there was evening and there was morning a third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons, <clears throat> for days and for years, and let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God let, set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, each across the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the cattle according to their kinds, and everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, 
and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Our hymn of preparation is Go Make of All Disciples. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all four verses. chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And uh, before I say a little prayer this morning, I just want to let you know if you ever doubted whether or not when somebody asked you to pray, if that person ever realized you pray, you know, that's between you and God. But I have to tell you, I was awfully calm in the hospital for the 10 days I was there, and there was a couple of scary things going on, and I, I calmed right down. And that was without drugs. <laughs> Too bad, but it was without drugs. And um, I, I just want you to know I thank you from the bottom of my heart because you're really family to me. And I know, I, I know the love. I know the love because you've asked God to take care of me. And I thank you for that. It means a lot to me. I'm a, a big believer in prayer. It's communication with God. That's all it is. But it means something. So thank you. Father, this morning, as our preacher begins to give us a message that comes to us, I pray that you would lift up his spirit, that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, Father, that we would also be full of the Holy Spirit to be able to hear what he has to say. God, we can hear you in a still, small voice. But we also need to have a preacher to preach to us. And how will they not hear if they don't hear a preacher? So, Lord, I pray that you would double bless him. I thank you that, uh, you know, someone said today that he's coming back. I never knew he left. But, Father, I thank you. It's kind of hard to know that you're going to serve again and not know until 12 days before. So... I just thank you that he's here because we do love him, Father. We too have gotten to know some of the nooks and crannies of him, and we appreciate him all the more. I thank you for this church family, Father. I thank you that it's my family. And I, I just thank you in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. The theme of annual conference was sent. Um, we've had several themes in the last few years, and I think they've been kind of leading up to this one, the idea of finally being sent as Jesus sends his disciples out here in the Great Commission. As I mentioned earlier, the speaker at the conference was Andrew Forrest, and the theme was come and see. He said this is a good thing to say to spiritual skeptics, and I'd almost say it's uh, something to say to people who are skeptical about the church. But he meant it to apply to people who'd heard all the, the stories about Christians being a bunch of hypocrites, not having any love in their hearts. Could there really be this good thing happening there, this grace and love of God being poured out? He says, well, come and see. Come and see. Don't get into a fight. Don't get into an argument that just escalates until somebody says something they can't take back. Invite them to come and see. Andrew was in my class when I was at Perkins. He graduated just a, a hair before I did. And I met him there and had, a, as I said, a couple of classes with him. But within a short time of meeting him, he just sort of struck me as just so sincere and unshakable in his faith and his desire to share it that it kind of made me wonder what in the world am I doing this for when there are, there's somebody like him going out there. Also at the conference he shared something that I had been unaware of. Uh, the church that he's now pastoring, it's called Munger Place in downtown Dallas, had been one that was a very small church it had stopped reaching out to or connecting with the city, the actual people around it. There was just a handful of people left who had slowly been selling off the property of the church to keep the lights on and the, the, the building open. And for the last even year of its existence, they didn't even have heat or air conditioning. And in Dallas, that's just not viable. Now, what was the question to do? Should they just shut it down and abandon that part of the city? No, they had a vision. 
that they would actually shut down the church, refurbish it, and reopening it to the tune of over $4 million. And what surprised me is that this was our current bishop who really got behind this and somehow managed to raise that money. I don't know how well it went over with that conference. I know that because of tensions that were in that conference, we wound up, thank God, getting him here. But he raised over $4 million to renovate that church and put Andrew into it. And now, uh, this year, that church that began with a handful of members is worshiping around 1,000 a week at their Easter service. Uh, there was approximately 2,500 people worshiping in a gigantic tent in the park. And this after not even six years? From nothing to 1,000. Well, what is the church? What is it supposed to be? And the first place you might go for uh, an understanding of that would, well, first place I would go, I don't know about anyone else, is to the Book of Discipline and our Articles of Religion and Confession of Faith. I mean, what does it say? And Wesley pretty much borrowed from the Reformers. He defined it as the visible church of Christ, as a congregation of the faithful in which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments duly administered according to Christ's ordinance. The Evangelical United Brethren, which united with the Methodist Church in 1968, have somewhat changed it and expanded it. We believe the Christian Church is the community of all true believers under the Lordship of Christ, that it is the one holy, apostolic, and Catholic Church. It is the redemptive fellowship in which the Word of God is preached by those divinely called and the sacraments are duly administered. It seems under both cases to be about Word and Sacrament. It also says in the Evangelical United Brethren's Version that it's under the discipline of the Holy Spirit that the church exists for the maintenance of worship, the edification of believers, and the redemption of the world. That's fine. I would suggest that these are marks of the church. The word being preached. Jesus told us to go and proclaim the word. That the sacraments are duly administered. That this is a church that listens to what he told us to do to do this in remembrance of me, as we do each time we take communion. And also, as the Evangelical United Brethren included, that it's marked by the discipline of the Holy Spirit, and I would say that that means the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, love, joy, self-control, generosity. I've got them completely out of order, but that's, that's pretty much all of them. And what about our church, this church, not just this particular one, but the United Methodist Church? We're not the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, that church that is, is meant to be, in a particular way, a ship of salvation. It was written a long time ago, ex ecclesium nola salus, outside the church there is no salvation. And while that's true in the sense of the invisible church, I would say that salvation is Jesus' job, not ours. It's a work of God's grace. And indeed, if you read very deeply into Catholic theology, they'll say the same thing. But their focus is very much on the church as a church and what it can do um, to bring people to a knowledge of Christ. And we're not an ordinary Protestant or Reformed church. When the Protestant uh, Reformation came around, one of the things that we know most about it, or if you are familiar with anything, is the expression by faith alone, sola fide. In the Methodist Church, we emphasize that faith itself, of course, is a gift of God imparted by the Holy Spirit. It's through that spirit that we confess ourselves to be children of God. It's through that spirit that we can pray to God from the bottom of our heart and the, and the core of our being, Father in heaven. The Reformation had, in fact, five solas, sola scriptura, that it, we, only the scriptures could be appealed to for what uh, we need to believe, sola fide, only faith, only grace, and we're saved by Christ alone, and the last one is we're saved for God's glory. When John Wesley came along, everybody belonged to a church. His church was the Church of England. And probably all know the story of that. King Henry VIII wasn't having a son to fill the throne. The current 
Bishop of Rome would not give him a divorce. He had the church break from Rome so that he could get a new wife. It wasn't like the other uh, churches where it was split over doctrinal issues. It was a question of the king withdrawing it. But again, Wesley, in Wesley's day, everyone belonged to the Church of England. By being born English, you were born a Christian. You were born a member of that church. And their doctrines had that idea that you're saved by faith alone. But that wasn't doing the job. John Wesley looked around at his broken, contentious, recently bloody society. If you wonder how this nation came to be, it was because the streets and the county roads of England were running red with the blood of a revolution when they murdered their king and set up a Protestant government before they reestablished the monarchy. That was not very far in Wesley's past when he came onto the scene and he looked at this Christian country where everyone was a member of a church and everyone believed or at least maintained that they believed the right things. And he saw and probably thought to himself, you're not saved. However you might fare on the day of judgment, Wesley might have said, I see how you live, how you covet and strive, how the poor are neglected. I see your coarse speech and your cruelty. I see corruption in high places, and I, corruption right down to the gutter, where the dead bodies lie next to the empty gin bottles that killed them, and I say, you're not saved. And in fact, our United Methodist Mission statement for the Church of the Whole is Wesley's goal, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, but to make disciples of Jesus Christ. His language was to spread scriptural holiness, basically to actually be transformed by the gospel, to not just say we believe in the Spirit, but to allow the Spirit to govern our lives, to change us from within, having been brought to that point where we realize that we can't be right with God. That when we try to say on our own, our Father who art in heaven, we who know ourselves know that's a ridiculous thing to do. We don't have any right to do that. But by God's grace and by God's Spirit, we're brought to a place where we want that to be the case where we are made perfect in love, and we truly are God's children. And we emphasize grace in the United Methodist Church because we can't be those holy disciples apart from God's help. We emphasize grace because we do embrace the holy, abundant, joyous life as our personal goal. We have to be disciples like that in order to make disciples, which is why we're here, to become better disciples ourselves and better disciplers. It's interesting. You can't obey or follow Jesus' final commandment, go and make disciples without a church. You can preach the word. You can probably have, you can have an imitation of the sacraments. You can do it on your own. The Holy Spirit we know is a gift of all believers. These were all marks of the church that we talked about under the doctrine, but really, why is the church indispensable? Because you can't disciple others without a church. And even if you start on your own to do that, what happens if you're successful? You and a group of people form. You become a church. Discipleship in its very nature is the basis and the reason and the purpose for a church. Last week we looked at Acts 1.8 when it said, you will receive power, this is Jesus speaking, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. A witness is basically somebody who's doing a show and tell. They're showing and they're telling how Jesus has touched them, how they have been changed by knowing and coming to God. It's that come and see. Start by looking at me. Do we want that power of the Spirit? I think of course we do, but the question is how come we don't get it? 
God obviously wants to give it. Could one of the answers be that we don't want that power to be witnesses? We want it because we want something fixed. We want our lives to go better. We want to get rid of our problem with anger, our problem with gambling, or our problem with addiction because it's really getting in the way of us following our goals. To think that the real highest and greatest purpose for having that kind of power to be transformed is so that we could go tell people and show them this is a great God, a God of power and love. Why the Genesis reading? I mean, we went all the way through it. I thought, I kind of want to not say too much about that because I can go on and on and on. Genesis was a very important book for me of the Bible in my early faith, and some of you were at the series we went through called Navigating Genesis, where we took six weeks to talk about it and could have spent more. We don't have six weeks, certainly today. But that expression, the ends of the earth, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, Ends can also refer to reasons or purposes, why you start out something in the first place. What is your end? What is your goal? And I think the ends of the earth are many. I, it, would, it would shock me beyond um, reason to think that, that God didn't make the world for a host of wonderful purposes that we'll find out about one day. But the big reason, as far as we're concerned, as this passage has to do with it, is to redeem human beings, not to fix the world. This is a good world in order to redeem human beings. Otherwise, we're thinking that God did a sloppy job or that somehow God made a nice world, we messed it up, and he told us to go clean up after ourselves. That, that doesn't, that's not enough. That sounds a little bit beneath God. Did God bring Israel out of Egypt through the desert so they could eat honey and drink milk in Canaan? Mission accomplished? I don't think so. Was it not rather so that they would be drawn back to the Lord through their difficult experience in the wilderness? Drawn back to the Lord who is their beginning and their end, and that they would find rest for their souls, something that the world was never built to do. And if they came to that point where they truly rested in God, they could enjoy the bounty of the land without being ruined by it without thinking this is the goal and the end and the purpose of life, to live easily and comfortably, to enjoy the pleasures and the beauty of God's good earth. The world may not have been built to be that perfect place, but the kindness, goodness, and power of God are revealed and can be revealed in the world to those who trust them. One of the reasons Genesis was important to me was that there was a certain school of interpretation that said, yes, Eden was paradise. And it's all supposed to be great, and, and God gave us a good place to live, and we ruined it, and sin ruined the whole universe, and eventually God's going to fix it. Well, first, on the face of it, I, I didn't like that goal because it made God our servant as though the highest purpose in the universe was just to make me happy. But secondly, I looked at nature and it's not fit for that. It's really not fit to be a perfect place. There's something about this entire universe. It's governed by the law of entropy. And the more I learned about it as I studied astronomy and other things, I realized there is a clock ticking. The formation of stars that are, that are even capable of having any kind of life around them, largely over. They're not forming anymore. And there won't be any more planet systems either that are capable of doing it. The Earth itself, you know, during our last ice age, the carbon dioxide level dropped to within just that far of killing every living plant. Plants have to have some carbon dioxide. But if it were any higher, the sun, because it's been warming over these millions of years, is about to cook us. Earth is at the end of its life. So what is the point? Why did God create it? It wasn't for us to have a paradise. God had to be doing something else. And the answer for me was that God created a world for us to come to know God and to be drawn into a free and fully loving relationship. Well, that didn't work out so well, but God knew that was coming, so the world is now created to redeem not just a few of us, but billions of us. 
That's something I, I, you can ask me about sometime, is how much God has done to make sure that this planet went from a dead rock like Mars to a place that can support billions and billions of people. It's an amazing miracle all in of itself. But if we think of that paradise or that good life as something that is God's goal or reason for building the earth, the problem of suffering becomes intractable. There's just no way around it. It doesn't make sense. And in fact, Jesus doesn't really give any answers for it. I watched just this last week a video of Bart Ehrman. He started out as a fundamentalist Christian. He's now an agnostic professor of the Bible at a major university. And I heard him talk. And and it was like he was preaching. How can you believe in the good God of the Bible? I look at the Holocaust, I see the sickness in the world, but a loving God allow that, and I don't see any reason for it. Either God isn't loving or God isn't powerful. So I don't believe in the God of the Bible. And I didn't, I, th I could think of some responses to him, but that wasn't what first came to my heart. What first came to my heart was the thief on the cross, the one that didn't get it that was saying just what he was in that bitterly sarcastic tone. Oh, if you're the good Messiah of the good God, save yourself and save us. Stop this pain, get me out of this mess. But the other thief said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. When I imagine that in my head, two men dying the most excruciating death imaginable, no hope for them in this world. I see them with joy on their face in the midst of that pain. Not just joy, but hope, joy, and love in an impossible place, the richness and the fullness of life. There was nothing that Jesus could say to the thief that was speculous and that was mad and angry and bitter and skeptical. But even there in that moment, between him and the other thief who said, remember me, there was one more chance for that other thief to see and believe. In Ephesians, we're told about God's eternal purposes for the world. Oh, this, this is the mission of the Northwest Texas Conference. Um, we voted on it. This is our now our mission statement. We're going to be working on it in the next few years. And I told myself when I voted for it that I would actually memorize it. I wanted to go up to the mic and say, uh, if you're going to vote yes on this mission statement, go ahead, remember it, memorize it. But it is to inspire and empower creative ministries through innovative leadership to make new and deeply rooted disciples of Jesus Christ. And why is that not just a good mission statement for the Northwest Texas Conference or the United Methodist Church or indeed a mission statement for the planet Earth and the whole universe? That's Ephesians 1, 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. Again, it says in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, you know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of ages for your sake. The purposes of God that God had in mind, even before creation, was the redemption of billions of people, the creation of a people of God. The one who has been given all authority, Jesus Christ, the one through whom the universe was created, made his power known among his gathered people for that purpose, to send us out into the world to be witnesses and so make disciples. This is our calling. This is our assignment. The one who has all authority has given us authority to do this. To become and to invite others to be part of his own people, chosen, holy, and precious, to follow him and him alone in this world, to the death and through death, 
into life eternal, world without end. Amen. We are at 1130. I'm going to go ahead and take a vote. I've got a six-minute video from conference that talks about something that they're doing in Abilene, a United Methodist Mission Center. And then we can go ahead and finish up the service. You want to take six minutes to do it? I'm really, you know, I'm serious. We have a vote. Okay, how many think it's gone on long enough? All right, let's go for it. This is uh, related to the Peace with Justice Sunday. This is the sort of thing that might be happening in our area that uh, people are doing in order to reach out to the community. This video was made by Dustin Tetro. He just became, uh, uh, he, was, he was commissioned as a deacon, and he's, he does work down there in Abilene. He did a good job on it, and so let's take a look at that now.
and affordable housing. It's very hard for single though to rent a motel room even for less than 150 a week. They don't have the finances. For others, life changes abruptly, and the search for a new normal begins out of desperation. The new people are the ones that come in kind of bashful or with their head down. We make them feel welcome, tell them it's okay. That's why we're here. We're here to help. That's why like judgmental attitudes have no place here. We do have a lot of people that have said, I didn't receive help and I raised my family and we grew what we ate and, and uh, they survived just fine. They need to go help themselves. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to feed the hungry. Jesus' command recently weighed heavily on the heart of a young man from Wiley. I thought about the people in need and I thought, well, I would love to have somebody help me if that happened to me. That's all the motivation that Sense of Bingham needed to take action. Uh, it was a lemonade stand. I raised $423.08. Stetson's hard work selling the tart drink in the heat last summer quickly saw the service center paying several clients utility bills and buying roughly his own body weight in food for the shelves. There is, by the way, a particular scripture driving Stetson's love for others. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Because God so loved the world, we serve the world. I do that because Christ says that's what we're supposed to be doing. He was passing out bread and he eating with people, all kinds of people. I think everybody should get a chance to do this. And as a church, I think we need to be responsible to those less fortunate that need our help. Would ushers please come forward to prepare to receive God's tithe and our offering. Let us pray. God of love and peace, you created this vast universe. Through Christ, your son, you redeemed the world and people who were not your people, who were no people really, became your people, created and united by your spirit. Open our eyes to see in each and every person someone worthy of receiving the love Christ demonstrated through the cross. By your spirit, inspire and empower us to minister creatively to lead them to you in new ways, and so make new and more deeply rooted disciples. Use these gifts and offerings to support our church's mission. We pray these things through our faithful Savior and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen.
verses, and after the benediction, we'll sing the fourth verse as our response. <laughs> benediction. Christ Jesus has made you his own. Press on toward the goal of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. Press on to that upward calling of God in Jesus Christ and not neglecting his outward mission as ministers of the gospel. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of peace be with you all. Amen.